27th annual Lockheed Lecture. I'm Dr. George Drake, and I'm the Dean of the College of Education and Human Services here at Millersville University. We are able to gather here tonight because of the generosity of one very remarkable woman. Anna Funk Lockheed was a proud member of the class of 1925 of the Millersville State Normal School. Notice something different about that name, the Millersville State Normal School. As a student, Mrs. Lockheed was a member of the Glee Club, the basketball team, and the Page Literacy Society. Following her graduation, she taught in one-room schoolhouses nearby this location in Leacock and Gordonville. Mrs. Lockheed established this endowed lectureship in 1987 with the purpose of bringing to Millersville University notable speakers to address issues in education of importance and timeliness. If you look on the last page of tonight's program, you will see the list of previous Lockheed Lecture uh, speakers. It is a very distinguished list. And tonight, we will add one more very illustrious name to that list. Before I introduce Dr. Graytack, I would like to recognize a few special guests who have joined us tonight. I ask that as I identify you, please stand so we may recognize you. First, uh, I, I know that there are several members, uh, at least one member, of the Millersville University Council of Trustees with us. There are, thank you, there are several members of the President's Cabinet and their guests here tonight. Also, there are members of the Academic and Cultural Enrichment Committee, the ACE Committee. This is a committee that has a wonderful wonderful task, the enviable task of finding and bringing to this campus the kinds of people who have been delivering these le Lockheed lectures over the years. Please stand and be recognized. And even though they could not be here tonight, I want to thank members of the Lockheed family for their continued support of this event. I would also like to take a moment to thank those who did the planning associated Thank you to the small group of faculty who did some important brainstorming early on about tomorrow's panel session. That's Leslie Colabucci, Tim Mahoney, Tiffany Wright, and Scott Richardson, all of whom are here tonight. I saw them all. Thank you to you. Thank you as well to Helena Tulea Payne, who uh, was the former uh, dean, the interim dean of the College of Education and Human Services. She helped me out immensely learning about the legacy of this lecture and has helped me out immensely just in general in my transition. Thank you, Helena. She's right here. Thank you as well to Carol Reichler back there and uh, uh, Donna Vieira from event planning. I don't know where Donna is, but she's probably out working the front. Thank you for all of your hard work in making this event occur tonight. Assistant Kelly Davis, right here. Thank you. And so, on to tonight's distinguished speaker. Dr. Emily Graytack is the Director of Research at GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. GLSEN is the leading national organization addressing lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender issues in education. In addition, in addition to its work on policy, professional development, curriculum, and student leadership, GLSEN conducts original research on LGBT issues in K-12 schools. In addition to leading the research team at GLSEN, Emily teaches courses on various topics, such as research methods, education theory, and gender studies. Prior to her research career, she worked as an educator on child welfare and anti-bias issues for organizations such as the Anti-Defamation League and the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. She is an active member of the AERA, the American Education and Research Association, the Society for Research on Child Development, the 
the Society for Research on Adolescent, on Adolescence, excuse me, and the American Evaluation Association. As a nationally recognized expert on LGBT youth, Emily serves on the Gender Identity in the United States Surveillance Group, convened by UCLA's Williams Institute, and on the U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration National Work Group to address LGBTQI2-S, right, children and families. Emily holds a Ph.D. in Education Policy from the University of Pennsylvania and has been doing applied research for over 15 years. Emily first became involved with Listen as a volunteer in the local Philadelphia chapter in the late 90s and has been on the staff in, with Listen in New York since 2006. She lives in New York, in fact, and she nav where she navigates as well the public school system as an LGBTQ parent, and she does that firsthand. Please join me in welcoming to the podium to speak on the topic, the state of the LGBTQ, the LGBT issues in K-12 education, reflections on the past, Recommendations for the Future, Dr. Emily A. Gray-Tack. Thank <laughs> you. 
student who likes to play and play a lot. <laughs> the overachiever, <laughs> I'm really active in everything I do. Um, I play volleyball, I do track and cross country. I love school, I'm in five AP or honors classes right now, which is really exciting. People see me as this flamboyant, cool person that I think I am, so. <laughs> Music, I play the cello as well as a couple other instruments. But um, all around, I'm pretty geeky, fun kind of guy, or girl. <laughs> Above anything, I identify as Mexican and then a lesbian and a woman. I come from a hardworking family, and I feel that that shouldn't go overlooked either. I am African American descent, um, and I have a spiritual background, and I'm genderqueer. I identify as a lesbian on the LGBTQ spectrum. I'm just a Latin bisexual boy from the Bronx. Queer primarily, and then uh, trans feminine, and lesbian, and gender queer, and a bunch of other things. I'm a gay, lower middle class, Polish, Puerto Rican male who's basically lived in New Jersey for his entire life. But I really don't like labels, so I identify as human, and I identify as Kana. Put it simply. I identify as pansexual. I love based on personality. I don't really consider people's gender. I would say that I would identify as a hopefully gay man, um, especially Hispanic. I identify as gay, and also a very important to my identity is that I came from a rural community. I identify as a lesbian and also as gender non-conforming. There's a traditional definition of a binary gender system of male and female, but I think that most people fall somewhere in between and it's not just like black and white. So I identify as maybe somewhere in between. I like to identify myself as gay. I was raised in Mexico for six years, and basically, I'm a New Yorker. I consider myself a New Yorker, because until now, I'm here in New York. Well, right now, I'm, I'm more gender non-conforming, although I'd like to uh, fully transition sometime in the future, but just right now, in my current life, I, it's not really possible. So I'm uh, trying to be content with gender non-conforming. I don't really identify as um, fully male or fully female, I just sort of, I'm androgynous, I'm not really either gender, I'm just sort of me. Um, also what happened in Massachusetts was 
uh, the first sort of any kind of state action on LGBT youth. So Massachusetts started the Governor's Commission on GLBT Youth, and it is going today. They issued a big seminal report at that time that really acknowledged that there are LGBT and once we sort of accepted, okay, there are LGBT students, there are LGBT teenagers in the world, they're here. Um, then people started saying, okay, you're right here, but like you shouldn't be, you can change, right? We can change you. So you started to hear about conversion therapy and conversion therapy programs saying, if there's GSAs in schools, well, we'll have conversion. We'll do things like that. Um, and so thankfully at this time there was a listen along with the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Federation of Teachers, NEA, American Logical Association and others issued a primer, just the facts on conversion therapy that kind of laid bare the problems with conversion therapy, it's ineffective, it's damaging, etc. So that was sort of gay kids in our school. We can let them say gay. And I am saying the word gay here because even though some of this stuff had the word GLBT or LGBT, some of it did, some of it didn't, there was not much discussion about bisexual kids. There was not very little discussion about transgender youth in sort of this larger discussion. Um, we also had in the end 1990s the Nabosni, the Nabosni case, which was um, a student, James Nabosni, who was bullied so severely um, at school, he ended up suing his school district and winning because he routinely reported being bullied because he was gay, and the school district didn't do anything. He won a huge settlement, and this set outside like a series of lawsuits afterwards that really showed school districts that you are actually responsible for making sure your students are safe in your school. And that's where we get to the 2000s, where it's like, okay, seriously, LGBT students in your school face lots of It's not enough to know that they're there, but we're telling you, like, it ain't so good for a lot of them, okay? Um, so that's when 1999 is when we started and collected data for our first national school climate survey, which was um, at that time, and, and still really the only uh, national study of LGBT students, middle and high school students, and their experiences in schools. So we do it every two years. Um, there was also in the 2000s several high profile tragedies regarding LGBT youth. Um, there were several high profile suicides that were linked, correctly or wrongly, to anti gay bullying. Um, and there was the murder of Lawrence King, a middle schooler in California who was murdered um, when Lawrence asked another um, a boy to be Valentine and, and um, he was murdered by that child. Um, obviously, two lives ruined in that case. Um, and then, not unrelated to all these, there was a started to be a proliferation of states were passing anti-bullying laws. And most of those laws that have been passed, most states now have laws, by the way, anti-bullying laws, most of them are what we call generic laws. And that means that they do not enumerate specific protections. You know in like anti-discrimination clauses when it says like protected classes, race, sex, gender, et cetera? Well, the bullying laws, um, we found, and not just us, but many folks have found that if bullying laws do not enumerate specific classes of protection, they're not limited to, but including race, gender, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, um, religion, etc., they're not very effective. So most states don't have enumerated bullying laws, but some do, about 18 now do. And that's when we started to see a proliferation of, of anti-bullying laws, state laws increasing. And then in the 2010s, it was like, okay, safety is primary, right? Our students have to be safe at school. But there's more to it for LGBT students and for all students to be successful in school. Safety is a floor, it's not a ceiling. And so we're starting to look beyond bullying. What else um, are we looking at, are we thinking about when we think about LGBT issues in school? So for example, um, in the 2000s, we had the first uh, US Department of Education. They did an LGBT youth summit where they addressed many issues. Bullying, yes, safety, yes, but also um, student leadership, academics. Um, some State laws were starting to pass beyond bullying. So California passed the Fair Education Act that mandated um, LGBT inclusion uh, in history and other types of classes. And uh, states and districts started to pass, again, still few passing, but these are they're starting, and they're gaining momentum, specific policies or laws about how transgender youth should be protected um, and should be treated. Okay. So, that was sort of like the political, social landscape, what was happening. What we, we've also seen is a shift in attitudes. So um, we did a, a campaign with the Ad Council. Does anyone know what the Ad Council is? Does sound familiar? They're like the folks that do Rosie the Riveter, and they did um, Smokey the Bear, and did your brain on drugs, and all that precious stuff. Not banned, but the music, right? So the Ad Council, PSA, Public Service Center. So we were lucky enough to be the first um, LGBT-related uh, 
uh, cause that they, that they did a PSA book with. And we did a PSA campaign um, called Think Before You Speak. It was about an, 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 excuse me, ending anti-gay language with what they mean. And uh, as Ad Council does, they track their campaign with, you know, million dollar company and um, they track how their campaigns are doing. And they looked at changes in LGBT teens attitudes over time since we started the campaign and after. Not necessarily that they were caused by the campaign, but, but it's a really great way to see how they've shifted. And as you can see, I'm so excited because I have a laser pointer. As you can see, maybe, okay. So as you can see in 2008, about 50% of, of teens, not LGBT teens, but all teens, um, thought that they said they have a problem with people who are LGBT. I have a problem with 50% of LGBT. By 2013, that changed, the significant change to 61%. Um, I'm sorry, disagreed strongly. Oh my gosh, I was putting my off the point. Disagreed strongly. Um, right? Uh, and more teens are strongly disagreeing um, that they have a problem. So it's a positive attitude shift. We also saw a shift in the use of anti-gay language among teens as well. So in 2008, 21% said um, they never say that's so gay about something being stupid or uncool. They never said it. But you see by 2013, 41, 43%, like twice the amount said they never say that. That's a pretty huge shift. It's a pretty huge shift. Um, we asked about the number of teens who say sort of other types of anti-gay language, like faggot or dyke, and we saw it um, change. 52% said so they never said it, 71%. Now this is self-report, sure, so it's what they say, but over time that has changed. It's become less and less acceptable to use anti-gay language. We also, in our National School Climate Survey, I mentioned we track LGBT students, um, not the same students, but we track how issues are in schools um, every two years. And what we've seen is a small but <coughs> consistent and significant change decrease um, in anti-LGBT language heard by LGBT students themselves. So as you, sorry. So as you can see here, almost 100% of uh, students in 2001 said that they hear people say that's so gay or those types of remarks often or frequently at school. By 2013, it's down to around 70% if you're often um, we also see a decrease with other homophobic remarks and negative remarks about gender expression. And we also see the frequency of harassment and assault. This chart uh, shows LGBT students who've been um, harassed or assaulted often or frequently in the past school year. The top line is around, uh, based on their sexual orientation. The top line is around verbal harassment. The second is physical harassment and physical assault. You see something funky was going on in 2007, there was sort of an uptake. Um, around that, and then we've seen a significant decline um, for verbal harassment based on sexual orientation. Started out in 2001, about 40% experienced it often or frequently at school, down to about 20%. Now, obviously this is still um, kind of an unconscionable amount, I would say, right? We're still talking about um, a huge number of kids who are experiencing harassment regularly at school. So it's getting better, but it's not good. So that's sort of up to where we are now. Um, and now we're going to do this tech thing again. Um, and I want to show a little bit about sort of what the data shows about where we are now in 2013. There have been great strides in the fight for equal rights and respect for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Is the same true of LGBT youth in schools? Glisten has been tracking the school climate for these students for more than a decade, and the latest National School Climate Survey provides some insight. Schools are often still hostile places for LGBT youth, but progress is being made. The number of gay-straight alliances and other student clubs supporting LGBT youth continues to rise. When GSAs are present, schools are safer and more welcoming, but still only half of the LGBT students have those clubs in their schools. While most said they have at least one supportive staff member, far fewer could identify 11 or more. But in those few cases, LGBT students performed better. An LGBT inclusive curriculum significantly improves the school climate. But most schools still exclude those topics in their classrooms. And some teach negative lessons. 
the number of anti-bullying policies has grown exponentially, but only 10% of LGBT students reported theirs included sexual orientation and gender identity or expression. And students in schools with LGBT inclusive policies are benefiting from that. So when the majority of LGBT students frequently or often hear homophobic and transphobic language, are harassed regularly, <coughs> and don't have the support from teachers and staff, they avoid school because they feel <laughs> unsafe or uncomfortable. Many are even discriminated against by their school practices including unfair treatment of LGBT couples and gender-specific dress codes. Discrimination and victimization negatively affects their educational success and general well-being. In the past decade, we have seen the school climate for LGBT youth improve, but most LGBT youth still face harassment and discrimination, creating a negative school climate that deprives them of an equal access to an education. You can do something. Get the latest data from GLSEN's National School Climate Survey. Share this video and go to GLSEN.org to see how you can make a difference. Okay, sorry for the commercial. I mean, not really. Sorry, sorry. Uh, but uh, speaking of commercial, I forgot to mention that I encourage you to tweet at GLSEN Research or at GLSEN. Um, and also, I'm reminded to not cough when you have a collar mic on. Um, so since we talk about where are we now, and this is where we are now nationally, where are we now? We are in Pennsylvania. Um, so I want to talk very quickly about what's going on in Pennsylvania, and I wanted to know what you thought. Do you think LGBT students in Pennsylvania compared to the rest of the country are doing better or worse in schools? Worse? Anyone say better? Anyone think same? Okay, so overwhelmingly worse, I'll say better than the same. Um, survey says, they're actually doing basically the same. There were no statistically significant differences between students in Pennsylvania overall and students in the rest of the U.S. Um, the vast majority experienced uh, victimization based on sexual orientation, gender expression, in the interest of time. I'm just going to go through these quickly. Um, oh, oh, how pretty. Uh, and most did not have ac many, sorry, I should say, did not have access to school resources like GSAs, about 50% did, um, inclusive curriculum, about 20%. So very similar. Um, however, when you look about the um, state laws in, in Pennsylvania, remember I was talking about generic bullying laws, enumerated laws. Pennsylvania has a generic bullying law that does not enumerate protected classes. You may or may not have known that. Um, we recently did a study that we released where we um, did an audit, and I'm having post-traumatic stress disorders thinking about this, um, of all 13,000 school districts in the country. We looked at their bullying and harassment policies, and for Pennsylvania, we found that 87% of Pennsylvania school districts did have policies. Some of them weren't even that's true in all, in all states. Um, but only one out of four enumerated protections for sexual orientation, and one out of ten included gender identity. So some folks are trying to fix this. There's a new state law, Pennsylvania State Schools Act, to get, many of you may know this, the PASS Act that just been introduced in the Pennsylvania legislature that would provide stronger um, bullying laws that do enumerate. So I encourage all of you who are interested in advocating legally. Uh, not all, I'm sorry, 
we surveyed public school principals nationally, not all, I wish all, um, but public school principals about over a thousand. Uh, and looked at the percentage. Thank you. Oh, is that better? Is that better? Is that better? Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, and we looked at sort of what kind of professional development they provide to their school personnel, what schools provide. And you can see about 58% provide bullying and harassment, 41 diversity and multicultural issues, 39 other kinds of school violence like gangs and things like that, um, substance abuse, uh, 32, student mental health, 24. All important things that people should be getting professional development on, absolutely. What do you want to guess about LGBT issues? What percentage provided schools uh, LGBT on uh, LGBT issues, professional development? What percentage of schools? 16, 5, 2, 10, 8. Okay. Survey says? 4. It wasn't very different between elementary and secondary. I think secondary was 8 and elementary was 3. Something like that. Um, so again, it's not surprising that LGBT youth are struggling in some schools because we're not preparing our um, educators to, to be able to support them in the way that they need to be supported. Not for Millsville, we're doing great in actually. And I'm not joking, actually. There's a lot going on to support um, educators, as you probably know, here in Millersville, to try to equip them um, to help respond to student needs. But one of the things I want to talk about now, the main thing I want to talk about, is what we can do. So this is the situation, this is what's happening. Schools aren't getting training. Most places aren't getting training in pre-service or in-service. Um, and if they are getting training, sometimes it's not always the best training. So what can we, what can you all as community members, as teachers and educators do? Well, we know um, from our research, from other research, from what we hear from students and teachers, that there are four main ways, not the only way, but four main ways to improve school climate. And these are ones that you probably, many of you are familiar with, not all of you. Many of you may, may be familiar with. They're supporting gay straight alliances or other student clubs. Some of them are called queer straight alliances, rainbow alliance, um, gay and sexuality alliance, or gender and sexuality alliance. These are things where student-led extracurricular clubs uh, address LGBT issues in schools. And they're found to make schools better places, even if the students aren't going. The fact that they exist sends a strong message. They have an advisor, and that sends it, identifies the support of educator. Supportive educators are extremely important. They're actually the most important thing. We find out of everything, having a supportive educator who is visibly supportive to LGBT youth and demonstrates that support makes more difference than any of these other interventions. Um, having curriculum that includes LGBT history and events is also key and important, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And having comprehensive policies, not only anti-bullying policies that enumerate protections, like I mentioned, but anti-discrimination policies. Um, so one thing you can do is to think about assessing your school. You probably can't read all that, and that's fine. It's more for illustrative purposes. One of the resources I'm going to mention at the end is our Safe Space Kit. Has anybody used a Safe Space Kit before? Okay. Um, uh, don't tell our like promotional communications people. They'll be sad that not enough people are using it. So you should know about it. It's a free resource. Um, Bless you. Um, and one of the things it has is a guide to being an ally. And it gives a lot of tips and ideas and ways that you can be an ally to LGBT youth in your schools. It also has posters and stickers that you can hang off and that sort of things, like to identify areas as a safe space. Um, but it also has a little assessment that you can use. to. So I encourage you to go online, check out safespacekit.com, or whatever, both of them work. Um, and check your school. What are their policies and procedures? Do you have gender neutral and or private bathrooms or changing areas? Are Valentine's Day celebrations inclusive of LGBT couples? Um, what happens in prom king and prom queen? Are they gender neutral? So think about what your school's doing on these issues. Um, but what I really want to focus the rest of our, most of our time on, I think that most of us are here in this room because we have been or want to, or want to continue making schools better for all people and LGBT students, parents, and educators. Um, so most of us are really well-intentioned the way we do this, but I am warning you. I really, this is what gets talking, but I really don't want you to go off on a whim. What I mean is, I don't want you to have well-intentioned missteps. I think that there are a lot of things that those of us who are working really hard on these issues do with all good intentions um, that actually might do more harm than good. And I'm going to talk about four different categories of those now. One is ineffective response to bullying, inauthentic inclusion, tokenizing, and continually only using a youth at risk scenario. So let's talk about ineffective responses to bullying. Folks who do this, who want to really protect students and keep them safe, right? Think LGBT, they're having a hard time in school. I want to protect them. I want to keep them safe. 
Um, so that's a wonderful motivation. We all do that. We all want to. Oh, I think. Um, but then what happens is we do missteps. So zero tolerance policies, anti-bullying policies that don't take into context situations. We hear quite often from LGBT youth who are defending themselves and fighting back. It may or may not be the best choice, but then they are zero tolerance. You're suspended. You're out. Just as the same as the bully that you, the person that's been bullying you for you know, months and months and months. Um, and also doesn't give a chance to, it, you know, repair the community or repair trust within the educational system. Conflict resolution. Many people use conflict resolution for bullying, but bullying prevention <coughs> experts across the board say conflict resolution is not the right approach for bullying prevention because it assumes um, people with equal power and equal status that there is an equal conflict. This is not about a conflict. This is about someone else um, abusing or targeting, harassing someone else. Conflict resolution. Imagine being, we've heard stories of that, that, you know, that trans youth who goes to school every day and hears somebody, you know, hitting or kicking him or calling him tranny in the classroom. Uh, Repeatedly, repeatedly, and then what do they do to address it when you finally tell someone? Oh, yeah, you're going to go sit in this room and talk it out and figure out what each of your responsibilities are in this situation and how you can make amends with each other. I'm oversimplifying conflict resolution, I recognize, but that's not a good approach for people. Suppressing expression. So you probably remembered a little while ago there was a kid who was um, basically had been bullied um, for bringing a My Little Pony purse to school, and one of the responses was from the administrators, like, well, don't bring that My Little Pony purse to school. And I think that administrator probably was, well, I don't want that kid to be hurt. And like, let's not be hurt. Well-intentioned, maybe. Um, but what we do know about being out about who you are or how, what your expression is, is it does make you a target more. It is true. We know that. We, have, we know it through research. We know it through anecdotes, anecdotal evidence. But we also know that the more out you are about who you are and the more out you can be who you are in school, the better you feel about yourself, better self-esteem. So you may be targeted more but you have better self-esteem and you feel more connected to your school. And overall, you actually do better in school, um, even with you know, the negative effects of victimization. So the answer isn't stop kids from being who they are, or dressing how they want, or looking how they want. It's stop people from targeting those kids who are doing that. Um, oh, and I already talked about all these steps for us. Oh my gosh, I'm so far ahead of myself. Okay, great. The one thing I wanted to mention then is also the things to do in terms of to keep kids safe, in addition to what I talked about, Instead of zero tolerance and conflict um, resolution, people are looking into restorative justice or positive behavior intervention supports as possible responses for bullying. Um, and also making sure that anti-bias is included in your bullying programs. Most generic programs are generic. They don't talk about bias that undergirds most of this bullying. Not just bias against sexual orientation, gender identity, but bias about appearance, about weight, about race, about religion, about culture. Um, and unless you tackle that, you can't really address these issues. Okay, now, oh, whoops, see, this is technology again. Um, pretend that it's not there. Inauthentic inclusion. The motivation here is to be inclusive in the face of limited time and resources, right? So we all want to be inclusive. We know we're supposed to be inclusive. Um, but we do something that I, uh, that it's sort of a riff off of folks are um, no multicultural education, uh, diversity educators. Some things that people have critiqued are this concept of food, folks, and fun. Have you ever heard that? Like, oh, it's just about, People, you know, who have different kinds of foods and cultures and all different people from different areas, different, you know, people from different ethnicities and all, all their festivals. And that's all they do. And that's a critique. Like, don't do that. Like, there's more to it than that. That's very surface. And so I'm kind of pulling from that to talk about um, let's not do flags, folks, and fear. Okay? So what I mean by that is rainbow flags, pride parades, gay pride month, um, LGBT history month, all wonderful things. I love all those things. I do all those things. Um, but if that's all you do you're not really um, addressing issues around LGBT people and LGBT humanity. That can't be all you do. Similarly, folks, if all it is about, oh, here are all the list of all the LGBT famous people. Look, when it comes to far, Neil Patrick Harris, Caitlyn Jenner, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's great to acknowledge LGBT people, historic figures, that's, that's an important part, but that can't be all you do. And fear, which we'll talk about more in, in a few minutes, but um, fear is when you only talk about LGBT people because it's a scary thing to be oh my gosh, if you're going to be LGBT, you're going to have a horrible life. You know, people say you can't get married. No, I can get married, so that's, that part's sort of taken care of. <coughs> Unless Kim Davis is your clerk, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here to um, But, or, you know, you hear about um, LGBT people around uh, bullying and harassment, that's all you hear. Um, so I'm really... Please stay away from um, flags, folks, and fear. Flags and folks are great. Flags and folks are great. 
but not only flags and folks. Here, it's great. The other thing I want to warn you against is um, to not have the newest disorder that I am coining, OAU, overenthusiastic acronym use. We've all suffered from it. Uh, it causes alphabet fatigue, among other things. Um, what is LGBTQ, LGBTQ, LGBTQ. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't include all of these acronyms, or you shouldn't represent various members of community and acknowledge the community um, can be expanded and different people that you want to acknowledge. That is really important. But what I see more often than not is people throwing these up. They're not addressing trans issues at all. You're talking only about sexual orientation. Why are you saying LGBT? Like, stop it. Like, it's okay to only talk about LGB sometimes. Now, if you don't ever talk about trans issues, you don't ever think about them. That's not okay. But you don't fix it by just tapping on the T, right? Or sometimes they'll say LGBTQ, and I'll say, well, what does the Q stand for? Is it queer? Is it questioning? Uh, I don't either, both. I don't know. And I'm like, okay, well, then you're not really addressing these issues. Um, people say, I intersex. Intersex is super important. Like, we really got to think about intersex. Okay, great. Intersex is, an, you know, important. How are we thinking about that? How does that play into what you're talking about or what interventions you're putting? Oh, I don't know. Okay, well then let's not put it on there. Um, so please, don't suffer from OAU. It can happen to you. It happens to the best of us. Um, instead, let's integrate and incorporate LGBT people on topics throughout curriculum and programming, and let's have thoughtful and honest inclusion and meaningful acronym use only. Uh, another whim that I would uh, caution you against is tokenizing. And the motivation here is to educate. You want to educate, you want to encourage empathy, you want to give voice to people, LGBT bill, extremely important. Um, but one of the ways we do this sometimes is having the LZ LGBT zoo. Come and look at all the LGBT people, I will print to my classroom, they will stand up here and they will tell you their stories and it's so sad and can't you believe it, it's real people, oh my god, and then bye bye, we never talk about them again or anything. Okay? Um, so that's what I call the LGBT zoo. Hearing voices from LGBT people is extremely important. Bringing those voices into your classroom, and they are already in your classroom, even if you don't know it, is very important. Um, but treating them as um, a zoo is probably not the best way to go. Although, again, well-intentioned. And yes, we're having a panel tomorrow, but hopefully um, this is about what they're doing in their schools and in their classrooms, right? And this is not a one-shot deal, I hope, you know? So again, even the best of us sometimes have well-intentioned missteps. Um, and don't expect LGBT people to educate you. Oh, the gay kid came out of my class. Oh, great, thank God. Can you talk to the whole class about gay marriage and why it's important? I mean, I really believe it, but can you just talk about it? Because you could probably do it better. Um, we can't rely on LGBT people to educate. Um, so instead, make sure that they're reaching out to self-identified educators. Okay, so people in their GSAs, in your LGBT community centers, like listen, at PFLAG, at other LGBT local youth organizations, They've identified themselves as wanting to speak out and do things. Great, go there. Um, and then create opportunities for those folks who may want to give input um, to build up that. Okay, we want to have a pride day. Who wants to come help figure it out? Not necessarily, I'm going to go to the kid who I know has gay parents. Right, because that can be really stigmatizing. And that kid may not like want to talk about anything. Or they may be like too busy with soccer, right? Like, so we... Um, <laughs> lastly, <clears throat> in terms of the well-intentioned missteps, I want to talk about this youth at risk narrative. Um, and Glisten has been critiqued, and rightly so at times, for participating in this. And so this is one that is near and dear to my heart. Um, it comes from, I think, <coughs> compassion for what many LGBT students are experiencing at school and the need to demonstrate urgency to make change. Right? And there's no quicker way to try to get people to change things than to say, kids are dying. Right? Now, some of our kids are dying. That's true. Some of our kids are thriving. Right? Um, and some of our kids are just being just kids and just people like all of us. Okay? So, if your main discussion of LGBT youth is only as the victims of suicide or as potential risks of suicide, you're not talking enough about LGBT youth. Um, if you have an assumption that LGBT youth are damaged, so the minute a kid comes out to you as gay, your first answer is like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. Or, okay, um, that's great, let me get you to the counselor. Well, they might not need counseling. No, they might. They might want to talk to somebody. You might not be the best person. It's better you give them to somebody who can handle it. If it's not you, that's cool. But they might need support. They might be fine. They might just be like, right, I'm gay, so I was watching the show and did it. <gasps> Go to the counselor, right? Like, LGBT youth are not all damaged. Um, Any more than, like, everyone's damaged, right? <laughs> okay. 
Um, and if you do a curricular inclusion that only includes LGBT people, when you talk about, oh, gays were persecuted in the, Nazi, in the Holocaust also. Oh, and also HIV AIDS and the gay rights movement and HIV AIDS, yes, and they're victims of hate crimes and they're discriminated against and they used to not be able to get married. <gasps> Does that sound fun to be gay? Like, think about what a gay kid or an LGBT kid hears and all they hear about trans people is, you know, there's this rate of murders of trans people. Now, that's true. But if that's all they hear, if they don't see images and <laughs> celebratory images and just everyday images, they're just people like anybody else. Um, you may be contributing to the at-risk dialogue. And I encourage you to recognize that LGBT people are not the problem. I think we know this, but sometimes we position the youth as the problem as opposed to the problem being the system. The problem being a society or institutions that are homophobic, transphobic, rigid about gender binary. Um, so please remember these things, and please do not just use flags, folks, in fear. Stay away from uh, overuse of acronyms. Now, where we are going. Lastly, very quickly, I'm going to whiz through this because I want to have some time for questions. Um, there are a couple areas that I just wanted to flag for what are the new frontiers on these issues. And they're not new to a lot of us. A lot of us who are working on these are seeing these, but it's kind of what's <coughs> coming up in the zeitgeist. So what is around LGBT issues in elementary school? And I was really honored and lucky to be able to spend time with um, Dr. Scott Richardson's class, uh, elementary education class today, talking a lot about these issues. And we see this coming up um, in a couple ways now. People talk about homophobic slurs in elementary schools. Yes, this happens in elementary schools. Um, you may not be surprised if you actually remember that you were an elementary school student once yourself, probably. Um, there were homophobic slurs. Uh, the issues are coming up around families and LGBT families, sadly. Only 18% of uh, elementary school students were taught about families with gay or lesbian parents. Gladly, 72% were taught about diverse families in general, but only 18 about gay and lesbian families. And gender nonconformity. So here's the, you know, the girls in the, uh, uh, in the princess dresses, the boys in the block area. They seem to be having a great time in school. That's awesome. They're doing great in elementary school. What about that kid? Right, what about that boy in the princess dress? We want him to have the same kind of great experience. That's my son, by the way. So he's so cute. <laughs> Super cute. Okay. Um, and that is his that's that stress. Uh, so we want to make sure that schools are, are uh, safe and welcoming for all of those kinds of kids. Kids that conform to gender norms and kids that don't. And don't sometimes, but do other times. Um, another frontier I just want to mention is we're really looking at gender diversity not only in elementary schools, but we've been hearing more and more and concerns from schools more and more about transgender and um, gender diverse youth. So transitioning at school, right? What do we do when a kid who um, identified or was identified to us as a boy in ninth grade in 10th grade is back and is a girl? How do we handle that? It's a very real concern. Um, so there's some really concrete ways. Gender Spectrum is a great organization that we work with a lot that has school transition plans where the student and their family, or just the student depending, works with the school to figure out what that student wants and needs and how they want that to be handled. There's policy that you can do proactively. Don't wait for a student to transition, but set the stage for students to transition. I'm thinking about, I know this is like the ugliest slide ever, but that's it is what it is. Um, thinking about <coughs> gender segregation at schools, right? So how often are there boys and girls lines? Um, boys and girls in my school, we have boys and girls colors for graduation gowns. Well, I don't know. Um, and we know that trans youth, uh, almost two thirds of transgender students avoided school bathrooms because they felt unsafe or uncomfortable and over half of them avoided locker rooms. So these students aren't participating in their education or you know, are actually like, impairing their health and I go to the bathroom all day because they're unsafe or uncomfortable. In so schools really need to start thinking about how they can make sure these spaces are accessible to all students. And the last sort of piece of gender diversity in New Frontier I want to mention is the beyond the binary. Right? So I think we are getting to a place as a society where some of us are um, at least more comfortable with transgender people as long as they fit male or female. Like, oh, okay, I get that, right? Caitlyn Jenner, I get it. She's a woman. I get it. Um, but when folks sometimes are having a harder time, and what we're seeing more and more are um, youth being able to be out and proud about who they are and saying, and adults as well, no, I'm not trans male, I'm not female, I'm, I don't really feel, I fit in either gender. Some days I feel this way, some days I feel this way. I'm gender queer, I'm agender, I'm bigender. Um, so schools are starting to figure out, what do we do with them? Got, you know, we allow trans girls to use girls' bathrooms, trans boys to use boys' bathrooms. Great, the problem, we figured that out. That's awesome. Kudos to those districts. Many have not figured it out. Um, they should do with the program. Um, but then what do you do with the student that really doesn't identify? 
right? Our schools, our whole institutions are so built around this really strict gender binary system, even when it's something like colors of graduation counts. We're not sure what to do when someone actually challenges those. So we need to be thinking about that and figure that out. Um, here are some resources. Look, oh, so pretty. Okay, Safe Space Kit, um, I mentioned before. We have a similar resource for elementary, for any sort of respect. Um, lesson plans, guidelines, tips for elementary, uh, many other things. Um, I was going to show a last video, and it was really pretty and inspirational, and everyone would like it feel nice, but I think I would rather spend that time um, <coughs> turning it over to you all for questions and answers and discussion. Um, but if you want to see the video about 25 years of listen, you can find it on YouTube. Um, it's really pretty. So let me turn it over to you. Thank you. As we, many of the students we prepare here want to be educators. So when we think about our curriculums here at Millersville and other universities like ours, what kinds of things should we be doing in our courses to help with that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things you should be doing, there's, there's a lot of things you could be doing. Oh, thank you. Some of which you're probably already doing. Um, one of which I think is just every day being careful of our own language and making sure that we're using gender neutral language. We're not making headers like heteronormative assumptions. We're not making assumptions around gender or gender identity. We are giving examples that include two moms, just not to make a big issue and talk about two moms, but just because those are part of the diversity of family things. So one is sort of the everyday inclusion. Um, I also say I think it's really important to interweave critiques of, you know, being able to assess bias in curriculum that they're creating in the schools that they're seeing and being able to really think critically about what kind of lens they're using as they create this curriculum or as they see what's going on in their classroom or what kind of pedagogy they're doing. So encouraging them, and not just around um, LGBT or queer issues, but obviously that would, you know, come to any type of issue, whether it's sort of like, um, you know, from a, from a critical race standpoint or any other kind of standpoint, really um, thinking critically about that and, and really reflecting and allowing space for students and all of us to reflect on our own experiences and our own missteps and our own opportunities for growth. Um, so I think that that's really critically important. And then to practice role playing. I think a lot of times when we hear what's going on in universities and in professional development, there's a lot of what I just tonight, which is like talking at people. Um, but And there's a lot of affective change or desire for affective change. But there's not a lot of stuff that will help increase educators' self efficacy for dealing with this. So a lot of role playing, which you know, we all hate role playing, a lot here. A lot of people hate role playing. But actually doing it, saying the words, practicing it, seeing other people doing it, modeling it, showing model lessons, seeing it work, seeing it in practice. Um, so I think those things are really key to um, increasing self efficacy. It's not enough to change your mind or your heart. You have to be able to know how to do it and to know the words to use. I have a question. Uh, in terms of, you wrote a journal article on professional development of educators. Uh -huh. Uh, how do you, uh, how does one navigate teachers, educators' world view, whether it be their religious convictions, their moral ethos, how do you navigate that with um, providing a, a situation where it goes beyond safety in, in, in a school environment? Right, well I think one of the things you hit on there, right, it's beyond safety, so you know, it's, it's easier to be able to say, okay, you can believe what you want, but I think we all agree the kids should be safe and let's figure out how to do that. That's a little easier, we're kind of getting there. So right, beyond that, what can you do? 
Um, and how do you deal with people, educators, administrators, parents who have real views against this? Part of it is I ask us, well, what do we do with anything? We all have very different views. So what do you do if you're teaching science and you're teaching about evolution and you have a creationist parent? What do you do? Sometimes I think we think LGBT issues are so like out there and scary and like we don't know how to do it when you do know how to do it because we do it around this kind of stuff all the time. So that's part of it. I think, what do we do when you face any of this? <coughs> People who are, you know, speaking out against something that, you know, they might believe in, that you're teaching, or things like that. So that's one thing, is I challenge us to think about that. Um, I also think that administrators are extremely important. Any administrators in the room, like, hire yourself in the back, you know this, you're super important. We hear from students like, well, I just wish our teachers would do this. I want to do this, but our teachers won't let us. We hear from teachers, oh, I want to do this, but our administrators won't let us. We hear from administrators, I want to do this, but our superintendent won't let us, right? Like, <laughs> so it's like everybody is passing the buck, but it's also a little bit true, right? We also hear from teachers, like, just to have a principal stand up and say, like, you know, the words lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender in their policy, like, was huge. Like, it gave them this sort of permission to address these issues, um, they felt. So, Administrators can do a lot to set the stage um, and the expectations for what their teachers should be doing and how their teachers should be treating um, all students. Also, I think, you know, part of it is also legal issues, right? Like, some of it is legal. Like, well, marriage, gay marriage is legal, so that is the law. Discrimination of these things is, is legal or illegal. And, and so, um, in some cases, when you have discrimination protections for sexual orientation, gender identity, which is not in enough states, but where you do, you have that. It's like, well, it's the law. You know, you can believe what you want to believe, but this is how we teach in the classroom. Um, but I don't think it's easy, by any means. I don't think it's easy. And I think that one of the number one predictors, do you reference one of my journal authors, you might know, that's one of the number one predictors we found, and other folks who do this work have found, that predict um, what teachers do, what other people do around these issues, is if they know somebody, somebody close to them is LGBT. Not just like I met them once in, you know, the LGBT zoo, not that. But like somebody close to them is LGBT. That really is one of the things that makes a lot of difference, and it makes sense. A lot of this is about you know knowing somebody and seeing their humanity. Um, that's one of the biggest predictors. So providing up for real, authentic opportunities for people to engage with each other and, and be who they are and bring their full selves in. Because someone they love and care about maybe LGBT, they just don't know. So being able to provide space for them. Know. Okay. So. Okay. Um, your early, earlier slides showed some, some hope, some progress in how kids were, um, I guess, experiencing school and experiencing harassment. But then we, we learned about the whims, and I think we see a lot more whims than we see hope or progress, right? So, so what do you think accounts for the kids experiencing a, a more open and welcoming climate? If it's probably maybe not the adults, even though we'd like to think that we're preparing our teachers to be those adults, will they make a positive difference? It seems like we, we see a lot more whims than positive differences. Well, remember, the whims are well-intentioned. Well-intentioned. So, I, and I will say, although I would caution against the whims, I think a lot of those well-intentions come across to your students. I mean, how many times do teachers mess up, or all of us mess up in different ways, and students know we're coming from a good place? It doesn't mean we should keep doing it. But they, sometimes they don't know. And sometimes they know. So I think sometimes the well attention and stuff does matter and does make a difference. And they see that you're trying. Um, and I know for some stuff, some people say, like, seeing LGBT people at all was better than nothing. Like, it was better than nothing. Now, for some people, they said, I would rather have nothing than to just hear about, like, gay, you know, gay people in the all the time, you know. But, um, but I don't want to dismiss that it's, that it's not something. I think the changes we've seen are cultural. I think they're cultural. I think they're societal shifts. And I think teachers and educators are part of culture and society. So we are seeing more accepting teachers because we're seeing a more accepting public. We're seeing a more accepting um, society. And I think the more we can talk about this, the more that Millersville University can have a lecture, and I don't mean to point out Millersville just because I'm here, something specific about Millersville, but the more that the university can have a lecture where they talk about this stuff with teachers. I mean, remember, it wasn't that long ago that Harvey Milk was leading a campaign in California where they're trying to outlaw gay teachers and say teachers, gay people were not fit to be teachers. It wasn't that long ago, and yet here we are talking about how do you talk about gay stuff with like young kids, sponsored by the university. So um, I think there's a lot of change, and I think the more we talk about the missteps, the more we'll, we'll make them. Can I follow that up? I just wonder, right? Yeah. If you, if your perception is that kids are kids are doing this without our help, I wouldn't say that. You think they need our help? Doing what? Doing better? Uh, to make um, the experiences of kids who are non-conforming. 
more toxic? I think it's both. I think we're seeing generational changes. I think younger kids are much more accepting. Well, it just developmentally, a lot of kids are more accepting than stuff until they get older, right? Because yeah. they learn more prejudice. But generationally, we're more accepting of LGBT people, I think. But I also think, but it takes teachers. I mean, it, as a society, age regardless, we're more accepting. So I think it takes both. You take, it needs students to speak out and speak their truth and take leadership roles and run GSAs, but you need an advisor there who helps them and listens to what they need and gives them that support. I don't think it's either or. I think both. They both matter. I think. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not going to be loud. Use your teacher voice. Yeah. <laughs> I train social studies teachers, and we love, I love to train them to address controversial issues. And I often have um, questions around what should be a controversial issue that's legitimate to treat as a controversial issue. So I would say, like, climate change. We really want to debate, like, is that happening? So what are your opinions on setting up kind of a classroom deliberation or discussion around, let's say, controversies around should gay marriage be legal? It is. Is it still worth discussing since there are a number of people that still don't agree with it? Or do you say that student has occurred, let's not be treated as a controversy in a, in a high school, let's say high school social class? Um, I might, I think it's still worth talking about and talking about historically and legally, and there's still a lot of challenges out there, discrimination is still legal. And I would say, I would be careful, them potentially, and I'm just saying this off the cuff, of, and I know you don't intend it this way, but I think sometimes it's how I experience it, treating people's lives as controversial, as their mere existence is controversial. So gay people are controversial, but, but why? Like, they just are, right? They just, they just exist for people. And I think that this, stuff like this is often framed in controversial issues classes because there are polarizing opinions. So in some ways, it's a controversial issue. But on the other hand, thinking about the LGBT student who's seeing, like, their mere existence or their ability to love or be loved or you know be free from discrimination, be able to rent a house is debated by you know their peers. And think about the effect that that has is pretty intense, um, I think. And so I'd like us to get away from us from framing it that way, but I would like us to continue having the conversations. Um, how we do that and what those nuances are is, is worth exploring. Anyone else? Here we go. How about one or two more? Here we go. <laughs> um, I thought your presentation was really good. I actually want to thank you because personally growing up in a small town where it's not socially acceptable to be who you are, it was very difficult and to know people who are actually out there and want to help and are not afraid to get like that's the word I'm looking for. Get real. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but the fact that people are actually out there trying to help people in a community and trying to help us uh, broaden out and not be afraid and everything else is just is really inspiring. And I was actually sitting here like about to cry because I was thinking back on things that have happened to me growing up at, in school and it's really sad to know that like that actually happened, but to know it's getting better is what's making this, I guess, um, I, I completely, I just thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say that I think that there, the one people always are scared of the internet say it's scary, and the internet's scary for kids, and you know, how that's so cyber bullying. But I want to say the one thing that, that is wonderful about the internet and social media is that there's a whole community of people who are doing this work that obviously we all can connect with and hear about and hear their voices um, and, and not hopefully feel as isolated, even for folks who are in rural communities and small towns. Um, but I think about if I had had the internet when I was growing up, I, you know, some of my experiences might have been different. I might have felt a little better and less isolating. So hopefully that's true for some folks now so that there are a lot of us that you can connect with. But thank you. One, one more. Here we go. A little more specific. Um, my school district that I work in, they do have a GSA at the high school level, but I think it's important to also have one at the middle school level. Mm -hmm. There's some concern administration wise that it wouldn't be developmentally appropriate at the middle school level. And just wonder if you had any suggestions or, you know, how do I broach that? Sure. Well, first off, there are hundreds and hundreds of middle school that have GSA. Oh, and can I say if you're involved in middle school GSE, uh, GSA, find me? Yes. <laughs> so I can pick your brain. Thank you. Um, and join our Gay Straight Alliance's face page, Facebook page where you can ask who else is enjoying the middle school GSA and get some more resources. Okay. But um, that, we used to hear that a lot. We don't hear as much anymore, but we still hear it. Um, 
I think part of it is the demystification of what a GFA is. People still sometimes think of it as a sex club or like a social club, but there is a social component. Uh, but I think sometimes looking at what GSAs really do and can do, um, they, they celebrate no name calling week, right? They may celebrate um, LGBT history month, so these things are really, which might be scary in itself. So I'm not saying that that's not scary for some middle schools, but um, there are a lot of middle schools that are doing it. Um, it's, it's growing, a growing movement, um, and I think that showing other middle schools in particular that's being used by GSAs might help us. It's definitely be connected to other middle schools. And it's growing, for sure, and needed. Middle schools have less resources than, than high school. And middle school LGBT students have a harder time, just like statistically. Like, middle schools are harder, I think, about safety and violence in general. That is true. Um, and that's true for LGBT as well. But don't worry. Thank you for the question. Emily? I'll be here to answer any questions afterwards. I will hang around. Um, questions, critique, comments, would love to hear it. I hope you will come to the panel to hear what your fellow community members are actually like, doing the work in schools tomorrow at 10 a.m. at Apple Place Valley. There will be purpose There will be closed through. I won't be talking very much. Other people will. Please come. Excuse me. Thank you. engaged us well, you've given us an awful lot to think about, and for that I say thank you. And I, I too hope this is not a one and done thing, I hope this the conversation will continue. And if it does, when it does, we will have to thank you. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.